which I, that, that I then pulled Andrew and some words were exchanged. You know, what do you mean I've got two hours? How do I, how do even I from two hours with my own voice, right? So, uh, so I'm not gonna talk for two hours. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give about an hour's presentation now on the state of the Linux kernel. Uh, on the website it's called the Definitive Kernel Talk. Same thing. Uh, and then I'm going to take questions. Uh, interrupt me as we go if you have questions. Uh, if you have longer questions, it's quite likely that I will ask you to save it to the end, uh, whereupon there will be some time for those things. Um, and we may end up with a second on the break after this session. Okay. Let's see if this works. Uh, this is a Windows machine, it's not my machine, so we've already got any complaints about that. Uh, yeah, Andrew. Okay. So a little about me. My name is uh, John Masters. I'm one of the first commercial Linux on FPGA projects. Um, which for anyone who knows uh, anything about embedded systems, um, this is the uh, design of uh, embedded FPGA. Um, we, we basically designed a complete software, a complete object processor, ported Linux to it, did a um, bunch of other stuff around that. I could go into that, but I won't. Uh, I'm also the author of a few books, uh, some of which people actually buy, apparently. Um, I guess the, the most well known is uh, um, Building Embedded Linux Systems, second edition. Um, so I took over from Caribbean I more on that project. Um, it will actually be a third edition uh, at some point. We are beginning some work on how we can do that. Uh, one of the thought processes there is to move away from describing building systems from source, uh, understanding every recipe and every rule. That's not really what people do these days. Instead, what we'll probably do is pick something like the Octo Project, which is a new initiative, new embedded Linux initiative, and we'll probably write around that um, and then dive into some of the recipes that they have to give you more detail. Uh, thirdly, I'm working on a book right now called uh, Porting Linux, which is about doing new architecture ports on the Linux kernel. Uh, that will be out mumble uh, at some point. That's with uh, Francis Hall, uh, who works in this. Um, and I guess uh, other stuff I'm working on is on this slide, uh, including some Fedora ARM stuff. Um, and uh, Chris Tyler is speaking more about Fedora ARM uh, later in the week. Okay, so what do I plan to talk about today? Well, what I thought I would do is capitalize on the fact that it's been 20 years to give a brief history of uh, the Linux kernel. Uh, for those who are kernel engineers, which I know at least one uh, sitting in the audience, uh, this is when you go to sleep, have a nap, come back in about 10 minutes. Uh, for everybody else, uh, there's some useful background here, I guess, in the early days of Linux, uh, so even more than 10 years ago. Uh, how did we get to where we uh, then, what happened over the last year that was interesting and different, um, or just happened in general? Where are we right now? So, what are the current topics being worked on? Now, clearly, I can't cover everything that's being worked on, right? I mean, every single release of the kernel, which happens roughly every 80 days, has uh, 10,000 change sets, uh, individual collections of changes. Uh, on average, so you know that that's crazy. Uh, 15 million plus lines of code uh, in total. It's 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 uh, not possible to, to kind of cover everything, but I'm trying to cherry pick a few useful things that happened. Um, and then I want to give some predictions about where things might go over the the coming year. And again, questions anytime. Just uh, interrupt me and feel free to ask. Okay, so 20 years. In the beginning, way back in 1991, uh, Linus
the small boards surfaced on one of the Minix user groups um, with this now very famous quote that he's uh, just doing a free operating system uh, and it's a hobby in what you bid for professional like you uh, etc. So it stops out as really just a hobby project for his, uh, his Intel AD386 that he bought and wants to learn more about. And like most people uh, of, of a certain persuasion, uh, Linus decided the best way to learn about that was to write an operating system for him. Okay. So it stops out being um, very uh, compatible with Minix. So he takes his existing Minix system and uh, writes a replacement kernel for it, but uh, at first he even keeps the file system and other pieces from his existing system, uh, so he doesn't have to go and reinvent every other piece other than just the, the core guts that he has about it. Okay, fast forward to today. Uh, where are we today? Well, uh, at this point, uh, just to compare that with this, uh, we now have 24 different architectures that we support uh, in the upstream of the Linux kernel, uh, plus many different sub-architectures. Um, uh, some of those sub-architectures have only one user, if your name is James Bartley. Um, great. And then many different platforms. Okay, so I'll come on later to the current situation with the ARM architecture uh, and the tremendous variety of systems that are supported uh, based on ARM processes, right? Uh, so it's 24, but it's 24 with many different kinds of combinations, right? So the PC, the Intel PC, a PC is a platform. Uh, the x86 is a processor family. Um, that's one combination, but there, there are many, many others that you get outside of this <coughs> x86 PC. As I said, there are roughly 10,000 change sets per 80-day release cycle. Okay, that's phenomenal amounts of change happening, right? It's not really possible for one person to follow every single change. Some people try, so John Corbett over at Linux Weekly News does an awesome job tracking what's going on, right? He's basically paid to do that for a living, right? But even he can't cover everything that happens. Uh, there's simply too much, okay? Uh, for, for this talk, one of the things that I did was uh, to take all of the change sets that happened over the last year uh, and just skim them, right? I couldn't read every single one, but I did go through the complete Git history um, over a period of many hours to look for interesting bits of information. Um, at this point, we have approximately 1,100 to 1,200 developers working on any one release of the kernel. That doesn't mean there are 1,100 or 1,200 in total. That just means that in one particular release, that many people contributed to it. So it's a very vibrant community. And if you look at uh, linuxcost.blogspot.com, uh, it's a blog where uh, the author is uh, tracking the current cost to redevelop the kernel uh, using various assumptions. So he's saying that you know the median salary for apparently for a US software engineer is uh, sixty nine thousand dollars a year. Okay, I don't think that Linux kernel engineers make sixty nine thousand dollars a year. I think they probably make a little bit more if they're professionally paid to do it. But uh, but he's assuming uh, the median salary um, and various other assumptions. And he came to this calculation that the current cost to redevelop the kernel would be three billion US dollars. Okay, so it's, it's, this is pretty serious stuff 20 years off. Okay, so how did we get there? What was the step in between? Well, uh, the first few releases were interesting. Uh, I guess the one of the interesting points here is that at first Linux was not even licensed under the GPL. So Linux started with a kind of his own license, which basically said, you can use this, uh, don't make money with it. Right? Uh, and he 
he's, uh, he's quoted as saying that switching to the GPL was one of the best things he ever did. And he did that early on, uh, and I think that's one of the reasons that Linux has been tremendously successful. So Linux 1.0 had, as you can see, uh, about 20 times the uh, number of lines of code. I don't think there was a point zero one. Wasn't it Freaks? Oh. Because we hadn't named it until Lars suggested a name, and I thought that was at point eleven. So that's interesting, because the, the archives I looked at had that number, but that doesn't mean that it was, in fact, that number at the time. So if anyone can correct and say, was it ever actually 0 0.01, I'd be interested to know. Uh, I, I admit, I, I cheated by just looking at Kernel Logo uh, and archives, because I, I wasn't involved at that point, right? I'm, I'm mining to find out before my time. Uh, so I don't know. Uh, maybe, right? It may, it may not have been pulled 0 0.01 until later on. Um, so if anyone can correct us before the end of the talk, great, go ahead. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, so the Lex 1.0 came a little later than the, the very first thing he ever posted. Um, still supported only the 386 processor. <laughs> Uh, and then prior to 1.2, uh, support for something called ELF, which uh, you know, we now take for granted that's the, uh, the executable file format that we use, uh, that was merged. But back in the very early days of Linux, uh, binaries were still uh, linked in a format called A.out. So some people who were around very early on remember a rather painful switch uh, in binary uh, executable format for a.out to ELF. Uh, at least 1.2 added support for a bunch of different architectures. So this is when some of the fun begins and people start realizing that uh, Linux is more than just x86, or it can be. Right? Uh, rather famously, Apple gave away, or Apple got involved in uh, promoting Mac. M-A-C-H, microfilm. Um, this is sort of, if you read your OS X history, you can connect this back, but um, back at the, at, at the sort of 1996 uh, time frame, uh, we're, we're pre-OS X, Apple's still trying to figure out the future. Anyway, they, they actively encouraged and helped work on something called MK Linux, which is basically Linux running on a shim based on the Mac kernel, M-A-C-H, microkernel, uh, running on uh, Apple's hardware. Okay? So that was the very first PowerPC port of Linux. Not really a full port because it's running on top of a microkernel. Um, but uh, that's an interesting piece of history there. Oh, and uh, when Linux announces new releases of the kernel, it tends to do so in rather humorous ways. Um, at the time he announced uh, Linux 1.2, Microsoft had been droning on about Windows 95 and how great it was and all the different kinds of licenses they had. So Linux posted a uh, lengthy announcement that analyzed the different free software licenses that were used by Linux and how great they were. Uh, so a little later on, we get to Linux 2.0.0. That was uh, in June of 1996. So at that point, uh, for anyone who cares, that, that, that's when I first recall being involved with anything Linux-related. Um, it's around this time that the ABC numbering comes in. So you have major versions of the kernel, minor versions, uh, and so forth. Um, with the idea that a 2.0 release would be the stable kernel, 2.1 would be development, um, and so forth. So you have a 2.3 development kernel, and a 2.4 stable kernel, and then a 2.5 development kernel, followed by Linux 2.6. So it's around Linux 2.0 that Linus decides that he's going to introduce this uh, numbering. <coughs> uh, and it's also around this time that Alan Cox 
Windows begins working on SMP support for Linux. So this is support for multiple processors. Um, and he does this rather infamously now through the introduction of something called the Big Kernel Lock. Um, this is a giant, very, very coarse grained structure that basically says uh, lock the kernel and don't let anything else anywhere run any kernel code right now, and then unlock it later. Uh, that big kernel lock finally went away uh, just recently, right? So it's taken a very long time to finally get rid of that. Uh, around uh, the time of 2.0, uh, Linux distros uh, switched back to uh, the uh, libc library from, uh, from GNU. Uh, so it's kind of a fact lost in history that for a while um, Linux kind of forked the C library, right? You can read through a, a couple of essays that Bruce Parents wrote around the year 2000. Uh, some other sources who are not Bruce, uh, other ones have found Bruce, but uh, some other sources have, have written about this as well. Uh, essentially, uh, the GNU C library around version 5 most of the distributors were carrying what was effectively a fork of this. Um, and then around 1996, the libc6 switch happened. It's also known as glibc2. Um, and that fork gets merged back in and kind of undone again. Um, and another data point here, kernel load, uh, which a lot of kernel engineers and people who download both kernels and distribution mirrors and pretty much anything else, um, that gets registered in 1997. So around the same time. Uh, and then 2.2.0 was released in uh, January 1999. Uh, and you can see the, the source code line count is increasing. Linus uh, has another famous discussion about penguins here. Uh, and we get yet more architectures appearing uh, in the kernel as well. Uh, so uh, the 2.4.0 announcement. Uh, so 2.4 uh, is is really the point when one of the first points when Linux moves from being sort of an enthusiast operating system to seriously getting the interest of businesses, right? So 2.4, you start to see a lot of embedded use of Linux. You see TiVo, you see other groups working on embedded Linux systems. They had prior to that, but 2.4 is really when things start to really take off. Uh, and similarly, it's when a lot of enterprise people start to consider where Linux might be going. Okay, so, 2.4 includes such cutting edge things as support for ISO plug and play. Right? So prior to prior to this, if you wanted to do automatic plug and play, um, well, good luck, and you would be running a lot of tools manually to do that. Nobody knows what ISO is anyway, so we'll just leave that. Um, it also added support for something called USB, which uh, you know has sort of taken off since then. Uh, another thing that was interesting about Linux 2.4 is that um, it breaks with their tradition of doing a new significant release to uh, to add you know fundamental features, right? So LVM, the Linux Volume Manager that a lot of people are using out of the box because their distribution sets it up for them, um, that gets added later. Uh, same with RAID and same with PST. Right. So this is the point when uh, the more risk is taken, assuming that the base is pretty stable and it's okay to go and play around. Um, one downside to that is that the entire Linux virtual memory management system was replaced uh, in uh, 2410. Um, and there's a lot of mating this flame wars, you can go and read about that. But for, for the sake of a history lesson, Alan Cox, uh, at that point, was, maintain, was maintaining something called the AC or Alan Cox kernels. Um, and Red Hat and other companies basically 
shipped to Kunos for a while there that, that had a completely different virtual memory system uh, than the one officially shipping uh, upstream. So, with the ability to change stuff, uh, you know, the so called stable release comes the downside that if you change too much, you know, you're really looking to do a completely new development cycle. Then we get to Linux 2.6. So 2.6 was released in December 2003. <coughs> uh, you can see the source code line count grows again from 1.8 to 6 million lines of code uh, in uh, 2.6. Uh, and again, 2.6, one of the major things about 2.6 is scalability and enterprise readiness. So this is a, another key point of inflection where the enterprise folks running you know, Wall Street servers or just you know, the, the guys with the real money start to wake up and say, you know, we could, we could, we could be using Linux. Uh, so in amongst the improvements there is support for the NPTL, which is the Native Deposit Threading Library. Um, that replaces uh, Linux threads that came earlier. Um, and I guess another point around the time of 2.6 is a further change to the development model. Uh, so soon after 2.6, um, it was realized that uh, development was kind of going pretty much okay. Maybe there didn't need to be a 2.7 development kernel. Uh, instead, features could be just rolled back into the, uh, the, the main release. So there's, a, there's been a change, and I'll come on to that in a moment. Uh, Dave Jones, who I believe is speaking this week, um, wrote a rather famous document around that time, which has been referred to as the post-Halloween document. Um, so anyone who wants to read about the original work that went into 2.6 uh, can take a look at that as well. Okay. So, changes in development. Uh, Linux 2.6 was not joined by a 2.7 development cycle. Uh, instead, what we have now is the concept of a merge window period where Linux kind of opens the floodgates, pulls in some features, uh, then there's a period of stabilization followed by release. So we stay in the 2.6 numbering uh, and we have these mini cycles within that. Uh, in 2005, to kind of coinciding with some of these changes, uh, Linus had been, Linus had switched to a proprietary uh, source code management system for, for the kernel uh, in 2002 uh, called BitKeeper, uh, which was uh, from a company called BitMover, run by a, a guy called Larry McCoy. Uh, and there was a little incident. Uh, in 2005, wherein uh, Andrew Tridgell, who is not the only guy who was kind of annoyed that a proprietary piece of software was used to develop the code, he decided to go and reverse engineer how the keeper did what it does. Uh, and that led to an inevitable backlash where the keeper said, okay, we're not going to let you use it anymore. We're going to charge you, or you know, whatever. Um, Linus's reaction to that was to go and write something called Git in a couple of weeks, um, which kind of does everything BitKeeper did and more. Um, so he disappeared and came back with something better in typical Linus fashion. Uh, and now most people are using Git for development. So that switch happened around 2005. Uh, in 2008, kind of adding more to this. Uh, Stephen Rothwell starts maintaining something called the Linux Next tree. Um, and what Linux Next is, is a kind of uh, baking feature. It's a, it's a place where work that's planned to get into the Linux kernel, but maybe just needs a little bit of soak time, a little bit of test time, a little time to bake. Uh, Stephen pulls that in uh, into the Linux Next with the goal that these are features that will be in the next. Linux kernel. Uh, so when the merge window opens, the idea is that these bits could go straight in at that point. It doesn't quite always work that way, but it's certainly been very successful. Uh, and Stephen is very busy posting 
uh, announcements to the Linux kernel mailing list with uh, new, build, new proposals of the Linux Snap stream on a daily basis. Uh, and then most recently, uh, Linus decided, I guess, uh, it had been 20 years, uh, and he doesn't like the number 40 very much, uh, that there would be no uh, 2640 release, uh, and instead we would go to Linux 3.0. Um, and in, in fact, uh, the, the very first release candidate was actually called 3.0.0. So he, he tends to drop that other digit, but certain tools, uh, which I'm responsible for one of them, uh, did not handle that very well. Assumed that Linux had three, three stupid, but there, there were some stupid assumptions out there. And they broke. So Linux said, all right, we'll call it 3.0.0 for now, but we're going to change it to, to 3.0. Uh, a lot of people were very annoyed that he didn't wait until 42, but <laughs> you know, okay, more than he did, right? Uh, the main thing, I guess, there is that um, 3.0 contains no earth-shattering changes of any kind. It's pure PR and marketing, right? So you bet every distro out there is going to come along and say, "We have Linux 3.0. It's better," right? Well, not really, but you know, it's going to happen. Right? Everyone's going to need to ship Linux 3.0. Um, but again, as, as Linus has said, there's, there's really nothing more in there. In fact, in many ways, less because he's uh, shortened aspects of this development cycle. But you can expect to see a lot of PR around Linux 3.0. Okay. So that was really just a very quick taster of uh, some random thoughts that came to mind when I was thinking about what happened in Linux over the last uh, couple of decades. Um, and now what I'd like to do is talk about what's happened over the last year. So let's start where we left off last time. So this time last year I gave a talk that you know kind of took the previous year uh, and went up to so June or July of 2010. So let's carry on from where we were. So in June of 2010, we're, we start the month with 2635RC2, the current kernel. So it's a release candidate kernel for Linux 2635. And some of the features we start to see appearing at this point, uh, multi-touch support, right? So multi-touch has been uh, a problem. If you have a recent MacBook laptop, you're trying to run Linux on it, you kind of like those gestures that just work in Mac OS X, right? These multi-touch gestures where you have multiple fingers on the, 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 the trackpad at once. Um, they need modifications to the Linux input layer to work, uh, and more of that work has been going on, um, especially with the uh, multi-touch event slots. Other things we see uh, in June, Microblades get stack unwinding. Uh, PowerPC uh, is another architecture that supports uh, multiple uh, birth events uh, using uh, basically uh, uh, multiplexing the, the number of hardware breakpoints that exist in the system and exposing that as kind of an arbitrary software interface uh, through birth events. Uh, let's see what else we get. Um, really lazy FPU. So Linux already has a concept that um, if we uh, don't if we don't need the floating point unit, uh, we basically won't set ourselves up uh, to to use it when we when we uh, switch into a task when we start running the process. If we're not using the floating point unit, we'll wait until we try to use it and then we'll set it up. Um, Really makes the MPU kind of goes the other way. It says, when I'm switching from a task to another, uh, don't bother saving the floating point context uh, until something tries to use it. So it's really lazy. Basically, you, you don't touch the floating point unit uh, unless you're going to use it at some point. Uh, Yinghai Lu 
gets uh, get more harassment uh, around logical memory blocks or mem block. Um, this is uh, this is a, an ongoing effort uh, to sort of reconcile the, the various different ways to manage blocks of memory. Uh, mem uh, LMB uh, didn't start out as being uh, the, the obvious choice here. It was actually used by a couple of other architectures. Um, but over the last year or so, uh, x86 and others have, have reconciled around using memory. Let's see what else we get in June that's interesting. Uh, Azul Systems hosts some very, very interesting pluggable memory management books uh, for the Linux VM. Uh, it makes everybody scream and run away. Um, this is the idea that they can improve garbage collection uh, in their Java runtime by uh, adding horrible interfaces to the Linux virtual memory manager that uh, many people just, just screamed at. Uh, July, we see 2635 RC4 and RC5. Uh, Greg Crow Hartman proposes removing configs to surface deprecated. This is uh, a configuration parameter that uh, takes the modern sysfs that we have in slash sys on Linux systems uh, and puts it back to how it was when sysfs first appeared. Uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, this, this parameter is needed because uh, older Linux distributions assume the original sysfs layout. And they include uh, things like L5, Red Hat Enterprise Linux 5, that a lot of people use. Um, this is a case where Andrew Morton, uh, who's kind of Linux's number two uh, in command, picked up on this because uh, he, he quite obnoxiously runs very old Linux distributions uh, to, to test what happens when you run modern kernels on them. So he objected because he said, look, it's very outdated. Linux distribution broke when you took this new kernel. It's an interesting mindset there. Um, I'll skip over the checksum thing. You guys can read more about uh, uh, um, offloading checksums. Um, Zcash uh, is an interesting uh, sort of next generation of something called Comcache. So this is work that's going on to add uh, compression to the uh, Linux page cache. Uh, so what we do is we say, uh, you know, we, we can store a certain amount of data around uh, blocks of files we might want to cache in memory. Uh, we could also compress that data. So there's some work going on there to basically compress various uh, file data we're storing in memory. Uh, in August, we see Linux 2635 released. Uh, it gains features like receive packet steering and receive flow steering. So these basically take incoming network packets um, and try to steer them to the CPU most appropriate for that network packet. Uh, for example, if a packet pertains to an ongoing flow of communication that a particular program is trying to, uh, to engage in, uh, it, would, it would make more sense for that packet to get processed on the processor that is running the application that needs that data. So that's an interesting development. There are some patches for running KGB on top of KGB. So this is the point where we start to see a lot of very interesting uh, debugging options built into the kernel. Uh, N265 is proposed as a flat version for embedded uses. So the embedded community basically says they're going to start picking particular kernel releases and kind of flagging them up as being uh, the release they would, they would recommend people do development on. So 2635 becomes the first flag release. Uh, other interesting things that happen around that point, uh, AppArmor, which is a Linux security module, it's kind of an alternative to SE Linux, um, and it's used by several of the major distributions. Uh, AppArmor is finally merged with the kernel. Now it works. So SD Linux works by taking every file in your system and applying a label to it that describes that file. So, uh, you know, uh, slash etc 
slash password uh, is special because the file itself contains attributes, not the name of the file. So another file with the name password would not necessarily have the same security behavior just because it's in that location with that name. Um, SC Linux is very powerful, but it, it confuses a lot of people and it can be difficult to write policy for it. Uh, so what AppArmor does is basically use path names. So it says, no, I don't care about signing labels and, and so forth to files, uh, slash etc slash password is special. Right? So it, it goes on path names rather than just assigning a security context to things. Uh, other things we see in August 2010, LIFC, which is the infrared uh, control uh, patches for Linux, these have finally merged now for a very long time. Uh, they had been out of tree. A lot of distributions have been carrying kernel modules to, to handle uh, infrared devices. Uh, that finally goes away. Uh, we get a new out of memory killer that's uh, compatible with the old one, but it changes behavior um, for which programs will be killed when the system runs low on memory. Uh, later in the year, we will come back with a kind of related complaint, which is that uh, we can now assign user space out of memory killers uh, for memory groups. So you can group tasks together, and you can say, for well, this group of tasks, if there's an out of memory event, uh, run this user space program that will decide what happens. Uh, Google came back and said, that's great, but uh, you need to allow a little bit of time for, for that user space process to happen uh, because some of their systems tend to get so filled with tasks there isn't even time for the out of memory killer uh, to run. Other things that happened in 2635, uh, barriers got removed from the block layer. Uh, so uh, a lot of intelligence around when data should be flushed down to disk and guaranteed to be flushed to disk is moved up the stack into file systems, which is arguably where it belongs. So, you know, ext3 knows best where what its journal behavior is and what it cares about in terms of was that actually rippers the disk. So now, in the future, file systems have to make these decisions directly um, through through uh, I think it's called flushing events and not uh, not barriers. Uh, and there's some other changes here that, uh, that you guys can read into in the slides. Let's see. Uh, September 2010, uh, Linux 2.4, 37 is released. Uh, it's 37.10 um, by Willie Toro, who's uh, the uh, 2.4 maintainer these days. Uh, 2.4 is basically dead, but some people still insist on using it. Uh, at that point, he announces a September 2011 end of life for 2.4, which is a very long time since it was here. Uh, that's since been extended. It's now going to be the end of this year. Um, and I can't imagine it going beyond that, but you know, we'll see. Um, uh, in September, Andy Clean uh, notices that uh, one of the optimizations we're doing uh, in uh, linked list operations uh, is completely, is it behaving in a completely counterintuitive fashion. So what happens in linked list processing in the kernel is we kind of preemptively uh, use, use a macro to, to force a preemptive fetch of the next element in any list we're handling. It turns out that modern processors and modern architectures do that better anyway. They are very good at prefetching. Uh, and if we explicitly do this, we actually undermine performance uh, on the order of 5 or 10%. Sorry, 0.5%. Still, it was significant enough that um, that it was proposed that this get uh, get removed. Um, in September, we also see several horrible security bugs. Uh, at least one of which was previously fixed and then appeared again, which is particularly bad. Um, let's see. Uh, one of them was that um, a, a little earlier, a couple of years prior, Linux had been changed so that you could, have, you could have an arbitrary number of arguments passed to a program. So I think Google wants the ability to basically have huge sets of program arguments passed to programs. All right, fine. 
but the logic in the kernel said that the limit for the size of these program <coughs> arguments in memory uh, had to be uh, one quarter of the stack size limit. Right? That was the maximum size. Unfortunately, uh, there may be no stack limit. It might be it might be negative one, um, and then you can cause various calculations there that let you write to memory you shouldn't. That was unfortunate. Another unfortunate bug happened in Ptrace. Um, so Linux is very good at zeroing out registers um, and catching uh, interfaces between programs and the kernel. One area where it did not do this was in compatibility syscalls. This is uh, allowing you to uh, have a 64-bit system that uh, implements compatibility 32-bit uh, system calls, and what was happening was uh, in the in the <coughs> ptrace, ptrace allows you to effectively call another syscall, call a compatibility syscall. Uh, when this happens, uh, one of the registers uh, was not being correctly zeroed out, so it meant that you could uh, effectively uh, again access uh, areas of kernel memory that you should not be able to access. Finally, another compatibility syscall uh, was missing an access check uh, to check that even the memory being passed to it was, was even valid uh, for the, the, the request. So there's some pretty, pretty uh, fundamental and obvious security bugs there. One of the things that came up was the notion that when security bugs are fixed, tests should be written uh, for those, and those tests should be run against kernels uh, to make sure that previously fixed security bugs don't randomly come back to bias. Um, and finally, I guess John Lindell will tell us more about this if anyone's uh, interested to, to, to go into Broadcom, but uh, uh, Broadcom released an open source driver for a lot of their uh, Wi-Fi parts, uh, which, is, which is good. Uh, I believe that's still in the staging tree. Yeah, still in the staging tree. Yeah. yeah. They're, they're good guys, right? So uh, I was I was really confused about this. I bought a, uh, uh, a network, had one of these parts in it, and then these guys go and announce, hey, yeah, your parts supported, right? And, uh, and I get all, I get very grumpy that, you know, suddenly I take for granted that my Wi-Fi works using an open source driver, and I can't suspend. So I start sending an email saying, how dare you? How dare you write something great? I can't suspend. It's not good. So never, never, never satisfied. So, October, we see uh, Linux 2636 release. Uh, some of the interesting features in 2636 contain support for a new architecture called Tile. Or, I guess, if you want to use the marketing names Tile Pro and Tile 64 of the architectures. And I'm going to give a lightning talk, uh, I guess it's Wednesday morning, Andrew? Yeah? I'm going to give a lightning talk on. Uh, tile, is, I just find it very interesting. What they do is, is they have you know, very simple, uh, complete processor cores, and they just build huge arrays of them, like a hundred of them on a chip, right? So this is this is not like a quad core system. It's like a hundred cores, uh, and then they have they have some very interesting ways that they communicate and handle uh, memory coherency in new and different ways. Um, one of the other interesting things about the Tile is that it uses Arn Bergman's ASM Generic reference in a very good way. So ASM Generic is um, a set of reference header files that Arn Bergman has published that basically tell you, if you are doing a new architecture port, here is what you need to provide. Here is a reference. Um, it's beautiful, it's very, it's very elegant, it's very clean. It's, it's about time, and it's very good that Arm has done that. So anyone working on a new architecture is supposed to use this reference, um, and the guys at Tylera uh, did. So Tyler is a very clean, very nice architecture port and a very good reference. Uh, I'm going to skip over a couple of those things. Uh, another thing I want to mention in October. Uh, we get support for jump labels added to the kernel. 
Uh, so jump labels are pretty simple optimization in theory. It's really saying, uh, I may want to execute this code, I may not. But if I don't want to uh, execute this code, uh, replace it with a null so that there will be no overhead if I disable a particular code path. Um, so jump labels can be used uh, in various ways inside the kernel, uh, one of which is trace points, but there are, there are more uses for it coming. Uh, other things added, we get uh, little endian support for PowerPC. Uh, so PowerPC being an IBM, basically an IBM architecture, is big endian, as all their stuff tends to be. Um, but some people might want to run uh, little endian because they have, uh, say, graphics parts in their embedded systems that assume a little endian environment. So they're building ARM systems, they're building Intel systems, um, they're assuming that they are not um, So support is, is pulled in for, for that case. Um, and finally, Russell King, uh, we're, we're having a lot of um, interesting arguments around the ARM architecture that really start around this point and continue. One of which, uh, so it turns out that on ARM systems, um, you can really only have one, one type of mapping for a region of memory, a physical memory. Uh, so if you have uh, what's called a device mapping for memory, so it's non-cached, it's just direct write back, um, and you have what's called a normal mapping, which is like normal system RAM, and they cover the same memory address, the behavior is not defined. Uh, but the behaviors work well enough for a long time, but it's on the fine. Uh, so Russell decided that was a good point to, to fix this, um, but that changes behavior and uh, bothered a lot of people. Uh, so for November, uh, we're still into 2637 at this point. The uh, Kernel Summit is held in Cambridge, Mass. Uh, Mike Galbraith posts what has been called the miracle patch, or the patch that does wonders. Uh, various other names have been given to this very small patch, um, which uh, basically does automatic C group assignment for tasks. So the idea is, if I'm building a kernel and I'm logged into my desktop and I type make, wouldn't it be great if the system would automatically say, okay, everything related to the building of this kernel gets treated as one unit um, and can completely swamp my system. But well, one way to do that is using a feature that's been in the kernel for a while with C-groups. Um, and <coughs> Mike effectively realized that you could say, you know, every task that shares the same uh, TTY could be grouped together. Later on, it was changed to the session associated with, with a particular process or task. But uh, this patch is very small and uh, the internet went wild over it because uh, it, it solved some very real desktop interactivity problems. Yeah. Is that container groups? Yeah. Oh. yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and there was a lot of pushback about that because, again, it's kind of putting policy into the kernel. Um, people like Leonard Kotering uh, pushed back and said, well, you know, there are ways this can be done in user space. Uh, Linus's response was really, well, yeah, but you guys have had a long time to do that and haven't yet. So, you know, uh, so where it is right now is there's support for this and you can turn it off if you don't want it. That, that, that seems reasonable. Um, but if you're just a kernel engineer and you type make, you know, your, your system won't die a death. You can still do something with it while, while these tasks are thrashing away. Um, okay, so uh, also uh, in November we see NAPS 2. Uh, finally pulled into staging. So YAPS is something that you know, many of us have worked on for a number of years, uh, yet another flash file system. Um, it, it was one of the first that really supported very large NAND flash arrays. Uh, it's a very exciting, interesting file system. I, I believe it's dual licensed. You can use it, you can uh, get a version of it that is uh, usable under uh, you know, proprietary Garments. I don't actually know how that's going to reconcile with, with this, but I do know that some of the guys who were 
originally working on YAMS have gone on to other things. So maybe this is just a logical conclusion of that. They're not trying to monetize it so much, so why not just finally push to get it upstream? Uh, Stephen Rostet posts a very simple uh, kernel testing script for winning test. Uh, he was, things like auto tool and so forth were, auto test were, were pointed out to him. Uh, but really, what uh, Stephen wanted was just something he could run that would very quickly build a kernel and throw it at some test boxes and get the results. I think it's what a lot of people want. So he's been working on, you know, kind of the, the quick and dirty solution that solves about 80% of the problem, or the problem that he has, rather than trying to write some glorious test infrastructure that most people want to use. We also see pStore service. This is persistent store, uh, which is support for uh, a region of memory supplied by ACPI. So ACPI supplies something called ERST, which is the Error Redwood Serialization Table. It's a fancy name for basically a bit of flash storage that your system vendor supplies and says, OK, if your system uh, has a panic or something bad happens, um, write out a little bit of state. To this flash. Um, so, pStore can be used for uh, capturing um, small amounts of crash diagnostic data in the field. That's its intended purpose. There, are, of course, are things like KDUM, there are more complete kernel debugging uh, mechanisms out there. But pStore can, can give you uh, that, that last little bit of a kernel log, for example. Um, it can be very useful in debugging. Uh, and Thomas Gleisner announced another simple utility called Trace. Uh, it doesn't really do anything earth shattering. What it does is drive other uh, infrastructure that already exists. So you can say Trace, give it a program, and it will collect all kinds of statistics using the perf events mechanism that's already in the kernel. Uh, and you can run Trace with other commands to, to pass the data that it, uh, it generates. Um, it's a reaction to his and others' annoyance with the state of trace tools we have out there, like system tap and so forth, and the perception that they are hard to use. Um, so you can follow the development of trace uh, if you're more interested in that. Uh, I guess the, the most interesting thing that happened in December was uh, Rick Van Riel posted about uh, Yield 2. Um, which is, um, the, the, I think it's now merged. It basically, um, so Linux is increasingly used as a hypervisor um, for guest operating systems, and we can do things like detect pauses. We can we can detect um, guest operating systems that are running where tasks inside that guest are waiting for a lock, and they are basically just sitting there not doing anything useful. Um, so what we can do is we can detect that, we can stop that guest from running um, and go and do something else. Um, what Rick has done is say, okay, uh, if we detect that uh, a process within a guest operating system is waiting for a lock, we can be more useful and we can say, give another virtual CPU within that guest operating system the rest of the time slice uh, assigned to that guest operating system at this time. So the assumption, the idea is that if a guest operating system is running several different processes, one is waiting for another uh, to, to, to finish with a lock, but the, um, the, the process that is, uh, that is currently running on one virtual CPU uh, is just sitting there waiting for another virtual CPU better to just give the rest of the time to the virtual CPU that can actually use it to make some progress. So Rick posted something with the other two, um, which implements that logic for guest operating systems. Let's see. So in January, we get Linux 2637. That's released on January 4th. The uh, big kernel log I mentioned earlier uh, is finally removed uh, in most cases. But not all. Um, there's still a few holdouts, but at that point, it is possible to build a Linux kernel that does not have the big kernel lock. FA notify support is finally enabled. 
having previously been in the kernel but not enabled uh, because there were some concerns around user space interfaces needing to change. Um, FA Notify allows um, anti malware software uh, to detect various VFS <coughs> activity and say, okay, well, you know, this file was opened. Uh, I need to scan it to make sure it's safe before you can use this file. Uh, so FA Notify lets you do some interesting uh, monitoring and, and interception of various uh, activities related to files. That's going to keep some of the malware guys happy. Uh, transparent huge pages got merged into the game. Um, this is a uh, automatic version of uh, huge TLB support that's been in the middle for a while. So previously, limited numbers of users in the kernel one. Uh, for example, big database vendors took advantage of an optimization around huge TLBs. So a TLB is a uh, in-processor data structure. Uh, it's a translation of the buffer. What it does is it caches any translation between a memory address that, or a memory page that a program is trying to access and the real uh, physical memory uh, page that that maps to. Um, but there are a limited number of TLBs inside modern processors. For example, <coughs> 512 entries or something like this. It actually varies based on the architecture and uh, you can get very excited. But in any case, uh, TLBs typically handle uh, the normal 4K, 4 kilobyte page sizes. But uh, what can happen is you can have 4 megabyte TLB entries, for example. Um, so you can have many, many, much larger TLB entries. Uh, but previously the kernel could only handle that if you explicitly requested that such entries be set up. So the database could say, well, I'm going to use a huge amount of memory here for this, so go ahead and create these large TLB entries for me because that's going to optimize uh, my access to these large chunks of memory, especially if the processor has dedicated uh, huge TLB entries. So some of them have certain entries that can only contain uh, this kind of entry. Uh, you may as well fill them if you can. Well, transparent huge pages effectively allows the kernel at this point to say, no, I can, I can decide when I've got large chunks of memory that I can actually set up uh, huge TLB entries for. So the good news is you, you get this feature, you don't have to do anything to enable it on your system. Uh, in, terms of, in terms of the, the runtime implementation, uh, it just works. Uh, and it will go ahead and create huge TLB entries uh, and uh, reconvert them back to individual pages in the case that uh, they need to be, various things need to happen, like being written out of swamp and so forth. Uh, around January this year, uh, various deprecated bits of the kernel get moved to the staging tree. So staging is kind of a dumping ground. It's where, um, if you're writing a new Linux driver, for example, and you're not quite sure you've done the right thing, but you really want to get it in the kernel. Staging is an area, driver slash staging in the kernel tree, is an area where, basically, you can put this code now, so it gets in the hands of users and testers, but it doesn't necessarily yet conform to all the norms and standards of the kernel. Um, so staging is where a lot of things appear, like for example, Microsoft's Hyper-V patches to support running under Hyper-V. Um, they are still in staging, have been for a long time. Anyway, Arm Bergman started to move a lot of things uh, that, that were interfering with removing the big kernel lock. He removed those uh, into staging. Uh, with the premise that many of them have not been used for a very long time. So, if you use Apple Talk, raise your hand. Right. That's an example of why, why that was a good idea. Right. No one uses those things, so we just move them out. The MSF has been replaced with SIPs for a long time, or CIFS. Um, so, there, there are replacement technologies out there. These are dead. 
move them to staging, ultimately kill them off. Right? But it's another interesting case of things going in the inverse. Normally, things go into staging and then they go into the kernel. This is sort of reinforcing the concept that stuff that's old and maybe past its time uh, might uh, get moved from the kernel into staging and then disappear. Uh, February this year, uh, so we're still working on 2638 at that point. I think one of the most interesting things that happened in February is that uh, Grand Likely hosted uh, initial support for device tree on ARM. Uh, and uh, that was really the final point where Russell King uh, sort of saw the light and, and, and saw the benefit of pulling that in. I think he had before, but but um, but this is the point, I think, where device tree finally gets that momentum. Now what device tree is, is a realization that for architectures like ARM, don't have a full firmware interface like open firmware on PowerPC. What you can do is, when you boot your system, you can supply the kernel with a blob, with a, with a binary object that contains all the kinds of data that would be supplied to it if there were a complete firmware implementation like open firmware. So all device tree is, is a blob representing the entries that would be in a, that you would get if you had a full open firmware implementation running and you could enumerate all the entries in that uh, tree using the open firmware interface. Instead, what you do is you get a blob uh, pre-created image with lots of strings describing your system. The reason it's interesting to, to ARM is that it lets us get away from just having random devices, cell phones and so forth, thrown together with ARM chips and you know, some kind of custom kernel pack to support this device. What, what uh, device tree lets you do is describe these systems in a very flexible way uh, like they would if, you, if they had these full firmware interfaces of other systems. So expect to see uh, much more work in the device tree area. Expect that to see us uh, add support uh, in the ARM kernel for, you know, kind of one kernel image, one kernel binary that supports many different kinds of systems because it can find out much more information at runtime about how that system is put together. And we're working on various standardization efforts around how ARM systems should move in the future uh, around that. So in March, um, we finally see uh, Linux 2638 released. Um, that G character on the end of the line is, is that Open Office insists on changing the font if you have a TH. Uh, so you have to put a character and delete it. I forgot to delete that. Um, the, the Wonder patch gets into the kernel. Transparent huge pages get into the kernel. Batman is pulled into the kernel. Um, Batman. It's just an excuse, really. I mean, someone had to use a name like that eventually, right? <laughs> um, Batman is a mesh networking protocol. For, uh, there's a, there's a uh, project in Germany called Freifunk, which is around sort of making networks freely available to, to everyone. Um, the, the, the main premise around Batman is sort of self-discovering mesh networks without single points of failure. So any node in the network can kind of figure out enough information about the nodes around it to route messages. Maybe not optimally, but in fact not too bad in one node to another. So this is kind of cool if you're living in an oppressive regime or something. You, you want to be able to communicate without central points of failure uh, using wireless, wireless mesh networks. Uh, transcendent memory is added to the staging tree. Uh, now, transcendent memory, or TMAP, uh, is uh, a feature. It, what, it, what it does is it says a lot of Linux systems are being used uh, to run virtual machines these days. So we've got hardware virtualization built into a lot of modern processors. We use things like KVM, kernel virtual machine, uh, to run lots of guest operating systems. It's great. 
But a lot of these gas operating systems uh, are caching their own data. What they're doing is they're, they're kind of maintaining uh, in-memory caches of files they've opened. The host operating system, the, the, the Linux running on the hardware, is doing the same thing. Right? So there's a lot of problems here when we have this kind of double caching. Um, that, those problems are being solved in, in other ways, but uh, what virtual machines are doing is they're putting a growing pressure on hardware, uh, on the availability of memory uh, in the host system. Uh, so what TMAP does is it, it gives guest operating systems uh, regions of memory where they can use, for example, to store uh, caching data or things they don't really care about too much. Um, and that memory may get pulled from them at any point, right? So it's transcendent. It may be there, it may not be. You may not get as much memory as you ask for. It may, it may come or go. It's really a way of saying, well, I have a little bit of extra memory <coughs> on my system. Let me try to help out some guest, uh, guest operating systems if I can. And you can read more about transcendent memory uh, online. Uh, in March, APM, the original power management support in Linux, uh, is finally filled, is finally uh, marked for removal. Okay, Great. Yeah, so uh, anyone who reads Middle.org, uh, it's always an April Fool, and John Hawley usually spends a very long time creating these, uh, inspiring with Peter Appen over this. Um, yeah, you can go read the archive on Phil Lowell, it's a very interesting suggestion that there's a parallel infrastructure of uh, planes with... Just go read it, it's, 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 it's good reading. Um, other things we see in April, uh, a new KVM tool. So uh, when, we, when we use KVM, we tend to use a, a, a piece of uh, QMU alongside that to provide virtualized I.O. to our guest operating systems. Um, if we don't want to provide guest operating systems with all of the bells and whistles of uh, QMU, we can replace it with something called imaginatively KVM. Uh, this program um, can do things like provide a guest with a serial console, uh, but not graphics. So not, not some other hiring stuff. But if you want to just run uh, test kernels inside a virtual machine, that's what this is intended for. Um, oh yeah. Linus has another rant about the size and the growth of the ARM tree. This ARM is really at this point, depending on the statistics, you know, up to 60% of the changes going to the kernel are somehow related to ARM. Uh, I, I tend to think that's just because ARM is a very successful architecture a lot of people are working on. But there are some problems there. One of Linus's complaints is that um, people working on ARM systems tend to uh, kind of work in different silos, reinvent the wheel. They're not always incentivized to work together between different companies to create infrastructure and solve problems. So there's a lot of duplicated effort, at least, going on there. This is unhappy about. Um, and finally, in April, we see uh, <clears throat> a lot more discussion going on around perf events, uh, specifically whether the kernel should uh, provide programs with kind of massaged, general, generic event interfaces, or whether it should provide the raw data that comes from hardware performance monitoring units in hardware. Uh, Ingo Molnar's argument here is that um, while we should allow user programs to, to get at the raw data coming from performance, manage, uh, performance measurement units in hardware, um, we should also expose that uh, in generic ways possible uh, so that you can you, know, you don't have to go and uh, change some user program every 10 minutes to support uh, some new piece of hardware. So there's been some interesting discussion around 
how uh, performance events should be exposed. Uh, in May, which is uh, you know, last month, um, Hong Goodman finally kills the big kill one with a patch that, that's uh, just entitled That's All Folks. Um, we see the release of Linux 2639, so that's the last 2.6 Linux kernel. That was on May 18th. Uh, amongst other things, it includes support for Unicore 32. Uh, Unicore is interesting. Hands up if you've ever heard of Unicore. Okay, one person, all right. Well, yeah, you, you would have mic, all right. But, um, so this is, uh, this is a processor design from Peking University in the People's Republic of China. Um, what they're interested in is developing technologies. You know, it's not really a nationalistic thing, it's more they want to develop their own IP, they want to develop their own processor designs and, and, and all this stuff uh, in their own country, um, have their own architectures, and so forth. And so the group that's working on this, that's their stated goal, is to create um, create their own architectures, create their own processor designs. Um, they have created a full reference system on chip design, their own, for example, based around Unicore. Uh, I believe Unicore 32 has been around for about 10 years. Right? But it's fun, the support for it is finding old versions. And it'll be interesting to see where that goes. Is it more of an academic research project, or you know, will we see Chinese-made um, processors, Chinese-made system on chip processors using this? That'll be interesting to see. Uh, finally, in May, uh, Grant Blankley, uh, who's a busy guy, um, posts patches for the Xilinx Zinc series of FPGAs. So, I previously mentioned that I don't work with, with Zilinx FPGAs. What they did back in the day was combine FPGAs with PowerPC processors. What they've done now is they've combined uh, FPGAs with ARM processors. So the current generation uh, of Zinc uh, FPGAs uh, include a uh, hard physical ARM processor around which you can create your own fantastical logic. Um, Zinc's quite interesting. If you guys have time to go read about it, you can do things like implement your own ARM coprocessors inside the FPGA fabric. So you can track on various ARM instructions and go you know, and implement them for yourself uh, inside the FPGA. So there's some exciting stuff happening there. Uh, again, that also supports the nice tree. Grant's doing a good job at um, allowing these very flexible systems to be defined and expressed in standardized ways. Okay, that's kind of the flavor of some of the things that happened over the last year. Uh, we'll put the slides up, um, and you guys can, can go through them, and you can email me if you'd like more information about any particular topic. I thought I'd just talk briefly about the current status for a few areas of the kernel uh, that may be interest you guys. So in general, uh, you know, things are looking very good going into uh, 3.0. Uh, we had one kernel development cycle recently where I think there were 1,250 developers involved. Um, so there's a spike there, but you know, that's a significant number of people who are contributing to kernel development. Uh, so the state is very strong. There continue to be the standard worries about, you know, does Linus scale very well? Um, he's the kind of choke point there, but you know, those, those concerns, I think, are um, uh, overblown. Uh, I don't think there's really been any burnout this millennium. Um, I think more interesting, more interesting are the security problems we've seen. So, uh, especially security issues that uh, come up and um, are fixed and then reoccur. Right? There was one other security problem last year I didn't mention that happened with uh, in the X server. Uh, what can happen is um, clients of an X server, X, of the X window system, 
uh, can basically request that the X server store various uh, data for them uh, in the X server's um, address space. You can combine various problems with, the, with that design to um, cause the uh, X server stack to overflow into carefully crafted regions of memory that you control. And if you do this, you can effectively inject code into, into for example, the X server. Um, the way that was fixed was to add a guard page, so was when when the stack is extended automatically uh, in running programs by the kernel, um, what it can do is it can, it can effectively add a guard page below where it has extended the stack uh, to try to mitigate against these overflow problems. Um, that was added. Uh, the most boring thing about that, though, was that it took um, it took quite some, some number of weeks or on the order of two months for that fix to go from being raised as an issue to properly being fixed. Right? So there's some issues there with, um, I guess the main thing is security problems that, that seem to be fixed and reoccur. Um, and Linux is increasingly clamping down on the, the merge windows. So last year I mentioned that uh, he, he was getting very annoyed with people basically posting patches on the last day um, and saying that's not the point. Uh, and so he's, he's, he's been kind of clamping down on this in recent times. So some of the other areas of the kernel, uh, embedded users, um, they got flag releases, so there will be more flag releases. So there will be versions of the kernel that are kind of blessed and intended for use in embedded systems. Config embedded went away and became config expert. Uh, there's a new config embedded, but that's different stuff in it. <coughs> um, GPL delays. Uh, so HTC, who make a lot of cell phones, um, decided that they would not be posting the code uh, they had change for those phones uh, for, for up to 90, between 19 and 120 days. Right? And at some point of the last year, one of the HTC engineers popped up and asked a question, and someone said, oh, are you the HTC? Refer to me this. And said, come back and ask in 90 days, and I'll give you an answer to your, <laughs> your, your problem. Right? So, but I, I think that's a little petty. I think that, that you know, the uh, issues around when code should be posted. Uh, so some, some guys got together and sort of proposed the idea that it should be two weeks, should be the, the nominal suggested limit for how long you can wait, rather than instantly. Um, so it does take time to collate things together, I guess. <laughs> uh, embedded graphics parts are a problem right now. Uh, so. Uh, 3D graphics has gotten a lot better on you know, desktop and laptop systems. Uh, but embedded devices, especially system on chip devices, uh, it's, it, it's a more sorry situation. It's still very much like it was on desktop and laptop Linux uh, several years ago. Um, another interesting thing I think we'll see in embedded virtualization support, uh, hardware virtualization support, on ARM chips uh, is landing. Uh, that would be, be interesting for those people who want to uh, you know, run multiple operating systems on a phone. Right? And there are some interesting ideas that have been posited there. For example, I might run one OS for my business applications and one OS for my personal applications on my phone. I guess you've got to do something with those cycles, right? The processor gets faster, you've got to find a use for it. So on the desktop, we've got uh, continued work on dynamic power management. A lot of very exciting stuff is happening there. With, you know, shutting stuff down that we're not using, and doing so in a very dynamic fashion. We'll probably see a lot more work going on with, you know, grouping of tasks 
things along the lines of the, uh, the wonder patch, but probably we'll see more of that from user space. So Leonard was talking about doing this consistently. There'll be other approaches, I'm sure. Um, radar detection doesn't really belong on the, the desktop. It's not really a client issue, but um, wireless parts doing five, on, on five gigahertz frequencies uh, are actually required for compliance purposes to detect uh, radar systems that are operating in the area because they tend to operate on that frequency, right? So the, the, the rule is if you, you can use parts of the five gigahertz spectrum, but um, if you do and you are transmitting and you detect there's a radar that moves into the area you're in, you're supposed to shut down. Uh, and if Linux wants to have support for these things, then it's going to have to implement, implement that. And there, are, there, there is work going on there. Um, in the enterprise, I think there will be a lot more work going on. And there is a lot more work going on in uh, SSD offloading. So this is using your solid state disks to, uh, to kind of cache data, for example. There's something called vCache, which kind of does this. It says, okay, well, you know, I've got my big disks, my big block devices. When I pull data in from those and I'm frequently using it, I'm going to cache it on my fast SSD that's over here. Uh, I think we're going to see a lot more of that kind of stuff going on. We'll see more work in the transcendent memory kind of area, saying, I've got this little bit of extra memory here. I can give it to you, but I might need it back any time. Probably see more going on there. Um, we, we're finally getting to the point where we've got all the core Zen bits in the kernel, including DOM0 support. It doesn't mean that everything you need to run Zen is in the kernel. The Zen hypervisor itself is still separate. Um, but it's a much better situation than, uh, than we were in just a few years back. Microsoft's Hyper-V patches are still in the station tree, and they have been for a very long time. Uh, at one point, Greg Crowe-Hartman threatened Microsoft with removing it uh, because they were basically not doing anything. It'll be interesting to see what, what happens there uh, when they finally get merged. A lot of the changes recently seem to be fairly superfluous. Uh, I suspect that the real-time patches, um, in addition to not having been merged, will not be merged uh, anytime soon. For those who were in San Francisco recently, uh, Thomas Gleichner posted a roadmap for the real-time patches. His roadmap was a map of San Francisco. So that's kind of his, his way of saying, I'm not giving you a roadmap for when that's going to get into the okay. So, some future predictions around this. Uh, these are all easy, I guess. I think 3.0 will be released before the 20th anniversary, uh, unless, unless it's run over by a bus. Um, I think there'll be more work done on SSD offload, as I said. Uh, I do think that Microsoft's Hyper-V stuff will be merged at some point. Uh, that'll be interesting, more for the symbolic gesture of Microsoft contributing code to, to Linux. Um, I think that the situation we've seen over the last year with fragmentation in the ARM ecosystem with many different uh, groups kind of competing and failing to communicate and having a lot more churn than perhaps is necessary, I think a lot of that will improve. I think things like device view will help. And again, I, I don't think RT will, will get merged anytime soon. Just the recommendations, I guess. Um, things I like in the kernel space. Uh, a lot of projects send very nice status emails. XFS is a good example, where you get to see what's been worked on recently. Um, when I've been doing the kernel podcast, which is kind of on sabbatical right now, I'm, I'm looking to. Um, um, I need to automate that. I, I talk with. Some some others like, like John Corbett about you know how, how to automate collating information on what's happening on LKML and writing it up. <coughs> um, the the pro
process I, I was using was basically just to read through the kernel mailing list and write these podcast episodes, but that doesn't scale. So that may come back, but um, but it certainly benefited from reading this, these status emails. You could go and look at a project and say, okay, what's happening in XFS? Oh, here's a nice monthly status email. That's awesome. I think it'd be fun in a lot of different maintainers would doing that. Um, there are still questions that come up on various lists, including the kernel list. Some of them are pretty naive or newbie-ish, but um, a lot of them don't get answered. Um, there's the standard pool for stability, but I think that's, that's improved a lot in recent times. Uh, and the standard pool for, for documentation, I think, again, that related to getting status. Uh, you know, I'm interested in everything. Uh, I like to understand how everything works and try to have an idea of it. And if there's documentation around it, that really helps my OCD. So um, I, I'm looking for more people to do that. Okay, so uh, I guess with, with that, uh, if anyone has any questions on anything, meaning of life is also a lot. What about BTRFS? Um, well, uh, yeah, exactly right. So Fedora 16, uh, I, I have a red hat. I guess I can put it on for a second. Uh, or a Fedora. Uh, Fedora 16 will use WebFS as the default. I don't actually know what the situation is with the file system checker for WebFS. Do you know? Is there one? I, yeah, I, I, I mean, I wonder. Uh, if you don't have the ability to properly check the file system, right? There, there was, a, there was a, an incident last year, I can check the numbers, but there was an incident where someone did some benchmarks and found that if you wrote just uh, a series of 2048 byte files to a butter OS system, I think at about 17% uh, file system utilization, it's, it's regarded as full. I think it was 17, you can check the numbers, but the reason is that it uses uh, a standard tree structure but to, to, to describe the file system metadata. But if the files are very small, they can actually be stored kind of in line in this tree. But unfortunately, it has a finite size. So you can create these situations where you get very poor utilization. Now, is that likely to happen in real life? I don't know, and, and some of the guys had uh, Motives to, to, to not like ButterFS, right? So, um, yeah, I think ButterFS is very interesting. Uh, I personally am not a fan of um, removing LVM from systems. I'd much prefer if file systems and LVM to work together rather than say, oh no, we can do RAID, we'll do everything, and we'll do it in the file system. I don't want that. I really like being able to manage volumes. And I think they could work together better. That's my personal opinion. Does that, does that answer anything yeah. with ButterFS? I, I'm curious about the file system checker, whether it actually does yeah. exist. Yeah. <coughs> uh, it works great, you don't need it. Yeah. If it works, you don't need it, right? Yeah. And if it doesn't, you're screwed. So. Yes, the goal is to 
Yeah, so, the, so to repeat the question, will it do analysis? Yeah, the, the, the goal of trace is to drive things like Perth uh, to generate useful data and then to allow you to pass that out and get the kind of information you would want. The goal is to say things like this and tap are very hard to use and not necessarily as friendly as they could be. So let's provide a nicer interface for that. Interesting to see where that goes. I, I've yet to really use it. Thank you. Yeah. Anyone else got any? Uh, yeah, go ahead. You mentioned FA Notify. Oh, sorry. Yeah. You mentioned FA Notify. Um, the performance numbers regarding the late to the FA Notify that was really performance. Uh, yes, yeah, so I Notify. And right, right. So there was something that originally called Talpa, which this is where FA Notify came from. This is one of the one of the mal one of the anti malware companies implemented this, and then it kind of fed into FA Notify. Eric Harris is the right person to ask, um, and, and others. I, I'm not. I, I was involved very early on in that, just in terms of looking people up and suggesting you should talk to these people. And so, you know, I, I take responsibility for connecting some of the guys together in the very early days there. Uh, my evil hat on. Um, I like some of the features that that gives you because you know people want anti-malware software, right? Whether whether we believe that it works or we put any stock in that, a lot of enterprises just want to check that box. So there's value in, it. in terms of performance numbers. Now I think it's I think we'll see that now that now that it's there. I think people will you know, hopefully start to use it, and when they actually use it. With real world software, um, real world malware scanning tools, then we'll see the results. Uh, you start, yeah. You mentioned previously that some versions of the kernel are best for embedded. Could you describe the library a little bit? Yeah, I think I think the goal there, so so to repeat the question, uh, you know, what's what's with the embedded flag thing? Why would you bless certain versions of the kernel and say that they're intended for embedded use? Um, I, I think one of the goals there, um, so a lot of embedded Linux work tends to, uh, in, in the real world, tends to just take a version of the kernel, uh, do some horrible hacking to it, um, and then throw something over the wall, post their you know, GPL compliance patches somewhere, and then just forget about it, right? And go do the next product. Um, I think this is partly motivated by realizing that's how things are done, and so not necessarily not endorsing that at all, but to say, okay, if we have a lot of these companies out there who are uh, going to base products on particular versions of the kernel, uh, at least here are the ones where we would think would be a good base for you to use. Um, I think the other part of it is we're seeing a lot more collaborative efforts like the Lenaro project is kind of a consortium of different companies that are interested in ARM devices, right? Um, and as you get more and more of these groups, they're trying to coordinate releases, and I think there is a lot of, uh, it makes a lot of sense to say, here's a kernel version that we're going to be working on for the next cycle. What are you guys going to work on? And you know, we, we could see the same thing happening with uh, tool chains, for example, but the, the churn there is a lot lower. So, uh, you know, the kernel's on a, you know, you're seeing four or five kernel releases a year, right? So I think, I think that's another reason why it's important to be able to choose a kernel version to work against. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I wanted to know, uh, what kind of uh, holds architectures in that uh, merge in the So you want to know what RT patches have been merged? Or why do you want to get it? Why do you want to get it? <coughs> Um, I think the, I think in, in one word, I think it's still performance uh, in the sense that whilst the overhead is increasingly increasingly small, what you what you do is you trade kind of overall system throughput for reduced latency. So what you do is you say, you know, a real time kernel may not be the best kernel on which to do massive number crunching if you don't care when that finishes, you just want to do it. 
uh, it is a good kernel to run if you want to guarantee that your stock trade happens within a certain amount of time. Unfortunately, I think it's still the case that some of the overhead there um, is, I mean, any overhead is, is, is annoying, and I think it's still big enough that there's still some resistance towards having that uh, in place uh, by default. Um, other than that, I think it's also just slowly pushing patches upstream. We had a period of time where um, I guess people were looking at other stuff and we didn't really see any new real-time releases. Um, Thomas has picked that up again recently and done some more, so I think uh, you know we'll probably see a lot more happening in the real-time tree over the next year. Um, yeah, that's sort of true. I think that, uh, I mean, you, you said it won't emerge in the near future. I think that maybe if there is a sense to create another big kernel like this map for real-time support. Um, do I think there would be another yeah. big kernel lock type thing for, for real-time? Yeah. No, I, I don't think so. I think I think where what they're trying to do is get to a point where there's just a config option it's kind of like you know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a single config option that you can turn on, and if you turn this on, it will perhaps introduce overhead. But if you don't have this config option on, it, 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 there's kind of no impact, right? Um, the ideal would be that you could have this turned on all the time. Um, I don't actually know if you build up a kernel with the RT patches and you turn off the preempt RT config option whether the overhead is zero. I don't know that. Uh, someone probably does, but uh, that, that, that would be a big part of it, making sure you can apply those patches in an intrusive way, and then turn off the config option that's already there, and just not have any impact. Um, that's a big part of it. The other part is uh, making sure that those pieces that are intrusive are as small as possible. Um, but you know, we've seen a lot of progress there, like you know, trying to interrupt handlers got merged, there's, there's, there's progress and I think it will continue over time. Yeah, but um, you made a statement earlier about um, uh, GTL compliance issues with HTC. <laughs> yeah. And it takes a bit of time to collate things. Um, are you saying that it doesn't take time if I <laughs> um, releases and things to go to QA, the through and distributed the customers, and one's more important than, than the other? If I go shopping at the bay, I Right, right, right. So what you're saying is you, you can't go to a store and, and walk out with a, some clothes and, or whatever and say, hey, I'll be here two weeks from now, right? No problem. Uh, that's true, right? You can't do that. Uh, so the ideal is always that, you know, day one when you ship something, you've been working on for a long period of time anyway, and you probably already have guys working. You know, you have engineers doing the work, right? They, they didn't have these patches. Um, you know, in the real world, these things are not as coordinated within companies as they could be. I do think there's value in having a grace period. I think the grace period is not 90 days. I think the grace period of a week or two is a reasonable amount of time to say, okay, well, you know, you need to kick someone and upload a file to an empty piece over. It should be on the same day. I'm not saying it shouldn't be. I'm just saying that I can understand the concept of the grace period. But if we're not dealing with GPL3, isn't the wording that it should be available through the same mechanism you got the original material? So shouldn't your device come with a CD with the code on it? Isn't that the requirement? No, there's, there's, uh, we need, uh, sorry, uh, Andrew's saying, isn't the requirement with GPLv2, for example, that um, the code has to uh, get shipped with the device itself, right? Um, so I'm not a lawyer, I don't want to get too far into that, but there are various different ways you can release code. So you can, you can do that. You can, you but you can. can't require someone to have to go and buy internet access to get the code if they bought the device at the store. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can make it through the mail for reasonable through, through, through the mail, okay. Yeah, yeah. You can. But the offer has to be with the code, doesn't it? The offer has to be with the code. Sorry, the offer has to do with the product if you yeah. ship the code to the product. So if they're not doing that, they're already in violation. That's the first thing to address. So you can have you can have you can have cases where basically you, you ship um, 
for example, the, the, the kernel uh, and you ship the source for every kernel that you, you ever ship and you keep that source around or uh, you can do the written offer approach which... Do they? Um, do they do that? Does the HD device come with a written offer? Probably does come with a written offer. I'm sure that somebody would have put that in there. But again, the, the thing is the, the reasonable period for compliance is, is the whole debate, right? So, so you send someone a written offer and say, I will give you this. But if you don't say I'm going to give it to you tomorrow, well, how long is reasonable? Right? It's, it's 30 days reasonable. Well, in business, you know, terms to settle on something could be 30 days, it could be 90 days. I mean, you know, 90 days seems just way, way off, right? But uh, I think it's reasonable to have a, some notion that, you know, maybe it might take a week or two to comply with it. Um, that's just reality. Uh, yeah. Um, so a dissenting vote. Um, so I've been in this conversation with many different manufacturers, and the thought process is, well, it's going to take me a few weeks to clean up my comments on the code. And I point out to them, quietly, uh, if you change anything, change one line of code, you've now violated the license. License doesn't say give me similar code that might build something that's almost like that could be a ship. Yeah. <laughs> The license says not only give me every line of source code used to build that binary, but also give me any configuration files and any make scripts and anything yeah. other than the standard set of tools that I would have to compile with. Yeah. So if you're taking any time to clean up your code, you're taking time you're to violate well. the GPL. Right, right, right. I so what, what the license requires is for the very source you used to build in your, in your exact compile environment when your binary comes out, Right. The code should come out of the tarball at that very same moment. So let me get that right. Yeah, I'm not in license. I'm so this is saying. something that many manufacturers, I'm not going to go into detail, many manufacturers <laughs> don't get. Yes. And, and, and it's right in the words of the license. Yes. Now, to address Andrew's point, that if you open an Android phone and you go look at the About phone, you do get a copy of every single license, and that does include the full GPL text which includes the instructions to the manufacturer that they should be telling you that you can get the binary, and they have the option of either shipping you a binary, I don't remember the period, is it remember the period? Three years, five years? It's three, I think. I think it's three years. For three years in the future, if they have a written offer. Um, so I've had manufacturers say, well, that license now complies, right? I told you. No, no, if you read the license, it's telling the manufacturer this is what you need to do, it's yeah. not telling the customer this is how they get it. So if they don't include a written offer, my interpretation, I'm not a lawyer either, right. is that they should have given you the source at the very same time they've given you yeah. the binary, which is the other option. Right. So if they didn't have a written offer, yeah. they, and they didn't comply with that, obviously, yeah. their other option is to give you the source in the same manner that you got the binary. That's where I understood. You got the binary over the air yeah. for free on your cell phone. Yeah. You should be able to get the source over the, the air, air free on your cell phone, right. which is not necessarily what you want. Right. But the nice. option should be there, yeah. or another compatible. Something similar. Now, if they have it up on their website and you need to go buy internet access to bring that down, that's covered under the. So they brought it up back here in a reasonable distribution chart. So if I, in my opinion, and I'm not a lawyer, the the license doesn't say this. But in my opinion, if you are offering the source code on your website, the day the binary is available for download, you've complied. And if you're offering it an hour later, you have not complied. And what you need is a written notice that says this is how you can get it in the future. You have those two choices. HTC is proposing <coughs> yeah. download this. Yeah. We're not going to do the first one. We're not going to do the second one. How's this sound? Well, OK, if it's a different license, that sounds great. But it's not. It's the GPL, and these are your choices. Just, just to be clear, though, I'm not, I'm not defending anything they've done. I'm just <laughs> saying that all I'm saying is I, I, I understand the notion that it might just take. It shouldn't, but I can see somehow companies are big, and it could take someone a day or two to put the files on an FTP server, and I, I don't think I would nail them to the same point for that. I'm, I'm days is really crazy. The implication is often, yeah. it's going to take us some time to clean, to clean it, it up. And that's, right, and that's and, not the right, right. Well, and so, so I guess if it takes you, you know, a day or two, the guy who runs the FTP player, the yeah, website, put it out of town, you know. I, I and let's be honest, that. HTC are not a company where the guy's out of town. It's not that size, right? So it's just a completely different issue. But, but, right, right, right.
I think we should probably uh, take one more question and then uh, have a, a few minutes break before we get to the next session. So, one more question. Yeah. You mentioned before a huge TLP is something like the kernel decides whether it wants to allocate the huge TLP. Yeah. Is there a way to give the kernel some kind of hint? And uh, once it allocated the huge pages for you, uh, can they be identified in the same manner as normal huge pages uh, are identified today? I mean, kernel code is identified. Yes, there is. So the, <coughs> the question is, is there a way to hint to the kernel that it should use a huge TLP entry? And is there any way to determine what is being used? Uh, so yes, both, in the sense that um, you, when, I believe when you do an MMAP, for example, you can specify an advisory flag that says use huge TLB entry if possible. I think, I think there is a flag that does that or has that semantic. As far as determining, uh, whilst it is possible to, to determine sort of system-wide, I don't actually know how a particular running process is supposed to know. Uh, whether, whether if I can know. I'm not talking about the running process, but uh, I mean, the kernel. Oh, can the kernel tell? Yeah, yeah of course, the kernel can tell uh, what huge TLB entries are in place. Um, but if you mean like, for example, if you're writing, if you're writing some code and you want to be able to use that information somehow, yeah, you, you could do that. Could your 